Hello, this is Joshua Gutman, and I'm here with director Bree Grant, producer and actor David Arquette, and his wife, producer Christina Arquette, to talk about the movie 12 Hour Shift, which was officially selected for the Tribeca Film Festival. Directed by Bree Grant, 12 Hour Shift is a dark comedy about nurses wrapped up in a black market organ trading scheme. Mandy, played by Angela Bettis, is forced to help her ditzy but dangerous cousin Regina, played by Chloe Farnworth, to locate a missing kidney she was delivering to her boss Nicholas, played by Mick Foley. Their evening becomes more insane when Jefferson, a convicted murderer, played by David Arquette, is brought to the hospital as Regina starts murdering patients to get organs. Hello? Hi! How are you doing? Good, how are you? Oh, it did work. Cool. How are mm -hmm. you doing? Things are good. Things are good. How have you been? Good. Good. Well, just right off the bat, just thank you for doing this interview with me, and I hope you're keeping safe and healthy during the virus and everything. Thanks. Yeah. No. Doing all right over here. <laughs> well, I well, I wanted to say also right off the bat, like I really enjoyed Twelve Hour Shift. I thought you did a fantastic job, and I really loved it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks for watching it. No problem. Um, what was sort of your inspiration for the actual story itself? Well, I've always been really interested in urban legends. So I wanted to take the idea, the one with the woman who wakes up in a bathtub and she's lost her kidney, or a man, I guess. Uh, and we're to take that idea and sort of put it on steroids, you know? Um, and so I sort of took that and combined it with this story that I remember from growing up about a nurse who was killing people with bleach in my hometown. I don't actually know if it happened in my hometown, but it was nearby. <laughs> so I took those two stories and sort of ran with them and created this insane mashup of heist movie and blood and gore and dark comedy. Okay, did you have any, did you have any cinematic influences as a director? You know, from the very beginning, we were, we watched a lot of stuff, but the main thing that I knew we needed to do was to keep it moving because everything takes place, almost the entire movie takes place in a hospital. It is technically a one location movie with the exception of a, of a couple of places we went outside of the hospital. So I knew in order to make it interesting, we had to keep constantly moving. And um, I, this is a movie that keeps coming back to me, which is, a, a one-shot movie so it's definitely not our movie because our movie has so many quick cut, cuts but there's a movie called Victoria that I think is incredible and it keeps moving and it's about this one night that happens to this one woman and it's amazing and that that was an influence as well as just like as you can imagine the sort of like Edgar Wright Tarantino world of things because it is sort of a gritty actiony movie. That's, actually, that's really interesting. Did you have a particular favorite even among Edgar Wright or Tarantino that really inspired you as a director? Um, I mean, I like, I'm a big fan of both of theirs. I mean, I like Kill Bill a lot, so maybe more earlier Tarantino stuff. And I did a rewatch of a lot of Edgar Wright stuff right before we shot. And I mean, they're all really good. I mean, Hot Fuzz was the one I watched a lot because I felt like it had that sort of, um, uh, people like working within a system dealing with issues um yeah those those ones i'd actually say well i know 12 hour shift was your sophomore directorial feature your first being friends forever which um premiered at the slam dance film festival back in 2013. can you go into either what you did differently as a director between working on both films you had like changes in your style or like even like maybe just any changes specifically well, yeah, there was a seven year difference between them. So there, I learned a lot in that time. Um, Best Friends Forever was my uh, first thing I'd ever directed. And it was the first thing I'd ever written that was shot. I co-wrote it with the co-star of it, Vera Meow. Um, and since then, wow, I've learned a lot. Um, <laughs> I think one thing I, I really tried to do on this one was to have a lot of fun and to not be so caught up in every single problem, if that makes sense. I think when you're making your first movie, you think you'll never get to make another one and you're constantly scared you're gonna screw up and you're not gonna take any big swings. And with this one, I wanted to take some big swings and wanted to make some really bold choices that were interesting to me. And 
I think I felt more freedom to do that because it was my second movie. And I think I felt more freedom to listen to other people around me and screw around and screw up. I think that kind of play is really important on a set. And hopefully I was able to do that a bit more on this one and we'll continue down that path with my next one. <laughs> <laughs> Can you also go a bit more into the casting? Um, how do you, like, because I thought Angela Bettis and Chloe Farmworth, they did a fantastic job in the film. Can you go a bit more into either like what, how you either had your eye on them and how you push them as actors? Yeah. Um, well, I've been a fan of Angela's for a long time, as I'm sure you have. Um, May was a really important movie for me. I, I think it was probably one of the first movies I ever saw that was a quote-unquote independent movie. Um, I saw it when I was in college and was just blown away and thought she was really amazing. So she's always been on my list as someone I wanted to work with. Um, and I saw her in another movie a few years ago called Drones and was like, wow, this lady has so much range. So she's always been on my list. And when we were thinking about casting, um, we had a whole list of people and I brought her up and my producers were like, yes, Angela Bettis, do you think she'll do it? And I got the script to her and she responded to it and we talked about it quite a bit and she basically came up with a lot of her own character ideas. I mean, I would love to take credit for Angela's performance and I truly cannot. I will say she came in with everything. She was so professional, ready to go. Um, Chloe, I was not familiar with at all. Um, she plays the part of Regina, sort of this like psychopath cousin of Mandy, who's, who's um, uh, Angela's character. And um, we actually watched a lot of tapes for that role because we wanted someone who was interesting and cool. And I just like, I, we couldn't quite figure out what we were looking for. And Chloe sent in this tape really early, like one of the first tapes we got. And she had this innocence about her. So she was doing these sick, crazy things and saying these legitimately psychotic things. Like she's legitimately killing people. And, but she had this like wide eyed innocence about her. And I was like, wow, there's no one else doing that. And that kind of blew me away. And um, she's British. So she had to learn to do the Southern accent. Um, and she came in and she pulled off this amazing character role, which I think, I think people will underestimate somewhat. She is a model and she's very gorgeous. And I think people might underestimate her acting ability just because she's so beautiful, but she's amazing. She's totally professional um, to the point where when I saw her audition tape, I insisted on meeting her before we hired her because I was so worried that she might actually be a psychopath. <laughs> because she was so good. She was so good. And she was just a joy to work with. I couldn't tell that she was British. <laughs> I, it is crazy. Um, I I was really worried about it because, you know, you're on set and she's going back and forth between the accents. And I was like, I think this is working. So right when we had a cut, I let a bunch of people, a, bunch of, a few people watch it just for her to be like, can you tell that she's British? And they were like, no. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> um, how were you... How were you able to get um, David Arquette and Christina Arquette involved in the project? Um... Well, they work with HCT Media, who is um, Jordan Long, Matt Glass, and uh, Tara Perry. And HCT, I had done a short with them a few years ago, two years mm -hmm. ago, I guess now. And um, they had asked me if I had any features that I ever, if I ever wanted to make a feature, another feature. And I sent them a couple of scripts and they responded to 12 hour shift. And um, they had worked with Christina in the past and David and so they brought them on board immediately. And so they've been on board. They were on the board since day one before we even knew what role David was going to play. So they, they were there. They were like in the casting sessions. They were watching t casting tapes and, um, and helping get things ready from the very beginning. Oh, that's good. It sounds like it was a pretty smooth process then. <laughs> you know what? Um, it is so hard to get a movie funded. And for some reason, I, I mean, I've been trying to get movies made for a couple years now in, uh, I, and with them, it was so easy. You know, having them on board, they were able to like get it funded and move forward, and it was great. I, I like can't say enough good things about how smooth they made that. That's great to hear. Um, do you have? Are you thinking about any particular potential future projects? Any ideas you have in mind? Yeah, um, I do. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about a lot of them. I'm in the process of writing some, and I have some other scripts that um, um, I don't know. It's a weird time right now for the industry. Um, I just got a, an email about how 
much. I am, I am going back to shoot a TV show that um, I shot last year, and there's going to be like weekly testing for mm -hmm. um, for COVID nineteen uh, on the show, and I think that's going to be tough on indie movies because the financial burden is going to be huge on productions. But I am talking to a couple of people right now about doing something. Hopefully later this year, we'll see if it happens. But definitely have more things coming up. It may not be this year if no other productions happen this year. <laughs> Well, that's all the questions I have. I really appreciate your time. It was really great talking to you, and I hope you stay um, safe and healthy during the during the virus. Yeah, thanks for talking to me, and I like this wallpaper that's happening behind you. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> it's like it, it's like very, you know, it's it's a little like southern. I think that's what it is. Like it reminds me of home. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, it's kind of funny because I'm in I'm in Baltimore right now. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, I'll let my I'll let my parents know that you like their wallpaper. <laughs> Help, let them know. <laughs> All right, have a good rest of the day. Are you too? Hello. Hello, David. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Hey. Hey, how's it going? Okay. Can you see us, Doug? Um. Yes, I can see you. Can you see me? Yeah, yeah. I like that wallpaper behind you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm. At, I'm actually, I'm, I'm staying with family right now because I'm from New York and you know how insane Great. New York is right yeah. now. So I'm back to Baltimore. It's good, it's good. That is That's some great. amazing, is that fabric wallpaper? Actually, yes it is. It's, well, it's just fabric wallpaper. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. <laughs> oh gosh, we have a stinky bass down, down here. <laughs> oh, is there a dog down there? Yeah. Oh. What kind? Basset hound. Ooh, cute. Like the big droopy eyed ones, yeah. With the long ears. Yeah, like where you just want to play with the ears all day. <laughs> yeah, we have four of them, which is a little. Oh, that's fun. so cute. Yeah. I wanted to start off by saying how much I really enjoyed the film. I absolutely loved it, and I thought you both did a fantastic job. Thank, Thank you. you. It was fun to do. When we watched it last, we did so um, in Los Angeles together as a cast and crew, just to see it together ahead of Tribeca. And so it was so fun on a big screen because it's such a wild kind of loud film. And Matt Glass, who shot the entire film, also originally composed all the music. Um, and, you know, the one scene kind of where there's this sort of anthem is my favorite part. So seeing it on the big screen was really exciting. And Unfortunately, we obviously lost that with um, Tribeca being pushed, but, um, but I'm glad you still enjoyed it, even if it was on a computer. <laughs> well, I mean, I want to want make sure you know, like I casted the film on, my, on a really big TV, so I wanted to make yeah. sure I still try to give it as close to the um, <laughs> theatric experience as I could. Good. That's awesome. You know, it was Christina's first film that she produced, uh, but she also produced the documentary that we did together about wrestling. But it was amazing to see her producing for the first time. Because, you know, I, when I met Chrissy, she was a, um, a reporter, a journalist, and uh, working at Entertainment Tonight. And she did a lot of her own editing and like, but it was incredible to see all the tools you have as a reporter and journalist go into being a producer because they kind of fit really perfectly. So it was amazing to see her sort of work with uh, Half Cut T, uh, Jordan, and Matt's company, and, uh, and Tara. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they just, the, that team that came together, I've known them all separately doing their own stuff. And then with Bria at the helm as the director, writer, it was really a great group of people to get together. Well, I think Josh can relate. So, you know, like in the reporter news world, you're always working <laughs> and you have deadlines and a lot of times things are 24 seven. And, um, you know, even in the midst of a pandemic, you know, you guys are still having to work as reporters. So a lot of that experience really comes in useful in producing. But to be honest, like I come from a documentary background. So for me, I've never, I don't even know how to read a script up until this first experience. So mm -hmm. it was a huge learning experience. And then um, HCT Media, who's Jordan Wayne Long and Matt Glass and Tara Perry, they also, Tara is stars in the film. She's an actress and she was a producer on it. But Matt and Jordan came from the documentary world. They won seven Emmys and we've known them probably for 10 years in Los Angeles. 
and I always wanted to find something to do together. So I remember they're all from Arkansas. All from Arkansas, yeah. Jordan, where we shot Tara, it. And Christine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember reading in the LA Times like an article about the second movie is the biggest hurdle to becoming a filmmaker, and especially when you're a woman. So, you know, we've always wanted to support female writers and directors. HCT Media believed in Bria and her script and kind of brought it to us. And so we decided to go back home where I'm from, which is Arkansas, to shoot it. Yeah. So, Christina, you mentioned how your background primarily is in producing documentaries and newscasts. Can you elaborate a bit more on the differences between that and producing a traditional narrative feature such as this? Like, I know how you mentioned earlier about read, about the challenges of reading a screenplay. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, doing David's wrestling documentary, it was very much like news. Like we shot everything as it unfolded. You know, it, uh, nothing was planned. Everything was just like crazy. Same as, you know, stacking the newscast and being in live news. Like it was on your feet and you never knew it was coming. And with something like this, you know, you really have to plan through it. You, even though we were a small production, you know, uh, uh, from hair and makeup to wardrobe. And also we were shooting in Arkansas, which is a new filmmaking state. So we had to find crews that were local and easy to get to. And so, you know, it, it sort of has the same feeling as when I was a news reporter where you're always kind of running off of adrenaline. <laughs> and mm -hmm. like, I used to do overnight shifts back in my local news days. There's overnight shoots, you know, on films. That's really tough and grueling. Um, you know, so I, I would say the reason why I probably, probably love producing is because I still get that same sort of excited adrenaline kind of everything is new to me everything is yet to be discovered kind of feeling um I just am not you know on air anymore which I actually am so happy because I'm <laughs> thrilled to be behind the scenes um but you know it's really crazy work I mean I think anybody knows you know and that's probably why everybody's so um, you know, disappointed this year with a lot of these festivals being canceled because it's not easy being a filmmaker. It's not easy shooting a film. It's not easy raising financing. It's not easy staying on budget. It's not mm -hmm. easy, you know, casting. It's just none of it. It's grueling But work. she also, this was like a little independent, low budget movie. So she's in there filling out all these people's time cards and like everything, like the first day of you. I, I mean, it was pretty insane. I was an was, assistant. Was I was travel coordinator. Yeah. I was a line producer, production person. And then I also was, um, during this process, applying to get my master's at Northwestern. So I would put a sign on the door for people like, please don't come in right now. I'm interviewing for my college. <laughs> so I was doing all these Great. weird jobs at the same time. And so I was interviewing for Northwestern and there was like people crew walking behind me and all these people like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm in a hospital in Arkansas shooting a movie. <laughs> What are you getting your master's in? Uh, clinical counseling, because I did a, we did a prison documentary together called Survivor's Guide to oh. Prison. And um, we met so that many incredible, Trail, right? oh, just so many incredible people from Van Jones's group, um, Cut 50 and Jessica Jackson, and Aaron Haney over there. Uh, so I really want to be able to provide services to the reentry space or incarcerated men and women. Mm. That sounds really fantastic. That sounds like such great work. It's been fun. And you've been wearing all these different hats during production. Is there a specific aspect of producing you prefer over others? Or is there an aspect of producing that you want to develop a little bit? I don't know. I just don't want to ever do overnight shifts. That's really hard for me. <laughs> I told her never do a vampire movie. Never do a vampire movie. I don't think I'd ever laugh. Night the shoots are all night shifts. But it was really fun also being on set with David because like he'd be in his little holding room, which was a just a hospital room and we'd sit in there and talk and like hang out together. So that part is really fun working with David and being able to share that with him. But it's also kind of strange too, being behind the scenes and having to tell David what to do. <laughs> well, David, that actually is a great segue because I wanted to ask like, since your prim most of your primary experience as an actor, was there any, were there any challenges or things that you enjoyed transitioning into a more producer role? Um. No, I love it. I like producing to a certain extent. I don't know. I, I don't like to like dealing with lawyers or agents or <laughs> anything <laughs> like that. It's just not my cup of tea. I'm more of a creative, like anything I can do to help, you know, that process. But um, 
which, you know, she is the boss, and <laughs> I was glad to see, you know, uh, some of the uh, focus and energy of, you know, you know, if she's getting mad, I was just glad it wasn't at me. <laughs> 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 he jo always jokes that when we're when I'm working, I don't hound him as much, yeah, right? Because I have like something else to do. <laughs> Can you go a bit more into what attracted you to the script, whether it's the story or the tone? It's yeah. campy. It's fun. Yeah. It's set in the '90s, which is kind of an ode to Dewey, I guess. If you <laughs> thought about it on that way, um, and also, you know, we are really in love with Arkansas and shooting in Arkansas, and. I think, you know, True Detective season three shot in Arkansas. So we came back, wanted to get back to the state and, you know, we did that through filmmaking, but it was just a great place to film, like the hospital that we shot in, um, you know. They were really helpful. <laughs> they were and, like, so helpful. It was incredible because we had this hospital with all the stuff and, you know, it was kind of perfect. They're like, do you need extras? We're nurses. We I know, we kept meeting all the nurses. <laughs> it's amazing. And listen, it's not lost to us that this movie is about nurses not behaving the best at a time <laughs> where at a time where we're truly seeing them for the heroes that they are. So yeah. I don't know. We wanted to put that out there. It is just it's a fun dark comedy though. I don't know. It's uh it's got a real sort of interesting tone to it. Some real uh I don't know, it's got a real uh <laughs> bizarre tone to it that sort of fits in this crazy world we're in at the moment i mean there's a musical number in it you know what i mean like that's, that's uh, yeah. out there, quirky and eccentric which is very much in, in tune with david's personality and for me i just love the 90s i'm a 90s girl i graduated high school in the 90s so all kind of the throwbacks of the 90s was really fun for me and kind of seeing everybody in like 90s sweaters and outfits um you know, so that was really the big attraction. And again, just to support a female writer, director, our crew and cast was heavily female as well. It's a strong oh, really? female. Yeah, we had a female editor who edited the film as well. So it was really promoting kind of women in this day and age in filmmaking. Um, and, you know, obviously that appeals to both of us. And we had to kind of twist David's arm to come spend some time with us in Arkansas because we were such a, uh, you know, this is my first film, but he was he was happy to do so and, and be a nasty criminal. You know, it's and not I too love, far from the truth. No. I love this group of, of friends that I met like in separate parts of my life all coming together and working together. It's really something special. Yeah, I was curious like if that's how you're able to get Mick Foley involved in the project. <laughs> yeah, I called him up. So one of my things is I love wrestling, obviously, and uh, I just think they're incredible like characters in general. Like, I mean, I always say like, I can't believe Stone Cold Steve Austin or Ric Flair don't have like a cop show on CBS. <laughs> it would be amazing to see them. I would watch that. I would watch right? that. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it would be so great. They're the best. And they could, they're so, they're such incredible characters. A lot of the time they have to be themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, so I called up Mick. He did us a favor. He came down there, had some fun for a couple of days. Well, I want to say, though, about Mick, I mean, he's such a huge, you know, he wrestled in Arkansas, so he's so beloved mm -hmm. there. But I don't know if you ever saw his documentary he did a long time ago with the, Morgan Spurlock, Becoming Santa Claus. Now, yeah, I, I saw that documentary. I yeah, absolutely so adore the documentary. So and he actually loves, to this day, Santa Claus. And he has, like, a Santa Claus room in his house, and he writes letters to children. He and wrote letters, yeah. Yeah, he wrote letters to our two children, so they actually think we're, like, best uh -huh. friends with Santa Claus. But also, um, in he the hospital... He writes them out in calligraphy. It's he's beautiful. got his own paper, like, that he's printed out. It's really so thoughtful. In the hospital, some of the families with kids, he was, oh. like, just so incredible and go and visit people all the time, he every gave day. Him the shirt off his back. Yeah, took the shirt yeah. off his back for somebody who was in the hospital there. And great guy. So just an incredible, incredible guy and a great actor. That's so nice. Back. <laughs> and we're about to go back to Arkansas. We're doing another movie tentatively called The Ghosts of the Ozarks Ooh, in Arkansas as amazing. well, starting uh, at the end of uh, May, oh, June. Yeah. Hopefully one of the first productions going up. So we've got a whole COVID protocol going. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I remember uh, earlier you were mentioning about picking out the picking out the hospital. What what can you go into a bit more of the process of how you were going, how you were picking out like where you which hospital you wanted to shoot at? Because I know that for many filmmakers, like location scouting is such a such an ordeal. Well, I think in Arkansas, it's kind of on the beginning of filmmaking. So, you know, after True Detective season three, the state really saw how great filmmaking is for the community. So really right now, when you go to Jonesboro, everybody's like, you can shoot here. You can do whatever you want to do here. The mayor's like, you can close down that. That's fine. So it just was such a fun experience because we basically could shoot anywhere we wanted. And then it was word of mouth, like Tara's dad. Uh, Tara starred in the film. She's a producer. Her dad knows everybody in town. He builds all the Starbucks. He builds all the, mm -hmm. so like we needed a car shop and her dad would be like, I got you a car shop and it's open. Yeah. And I went down that. there for a few days and I built to help build this Western town. It's just a really amazing. Yeah. Thing. So it wasn't so, hard to find locations because everybody in Arkansas is so excited to have filming there. So mm -hmm. we really had kind of any option that we needed. It was easy to find. In Jonesboro, where we filmed it, there's this big hospital that just opened up. And this was a smaller hospital from the like 70s or something. But it looked right sort of time period wise. And it had downgraded. So they weren't actually using a couple of floors. So we got to use those. That's great. I'm glad you were able to work so well with the community on the film. Oh, it's so fun. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about the casting process? Because I'll say like An Angela and Chloe, like they had fantastic chemistry. Can you get more into like how you selected, how you selected them? Well, I just think Angela Bettis in it is incredible. She yes. is so amazing and she's so low key. Like she's a very interesting, unique personality in that, you know, she's very low maintenance, very low key. And then she gets on set and kind of brought that character to life. And Chloe is so amazing too. And like, I just, every time I, I see Chloe, Chloe, I always smile because she's just got this like kind of wild, cool spirit. And, you know, Tara's really hysterical in it. And, you know, I think everybody was just there to have a good time, no egos. Really, we ate dinners every night together. You know, we were always together celebrating cast birthdays. It was just a really unique experience, like very family atmosphere. So the casting process wasn't really hard. I mean, where, where David came in really useful was with Mick Foley, which we, I think was a brilliant addition, uh, just you know, for fun. And you know, it's such a fun role for him to play. And actually the young kid that mm -hmm. comes up during the, the scene when Mick and Chloe meet for the first time and she doesn't have what she needs to have in the cooler, when he yells at the young kid and the young kid comes up, that's Ric Flair's stepson. So Ric really? Flair's stepson is in the scene with yeah. Mick Foley. <laughs> it's just all fun because he he's interested in films and stuff. So they come down, check it out. We had just seen Ric Flair for wrestling and we're telling him about the Arkansas film. And then um, uh, Rick's wife, Wendy, texted me. She's like, can Sebastian come on set and learn? We're like, of course he can. So. Wrestlers are funny, but if you cast Mick Foley in something, Stone Cold's like, hey, hey, what, did you lose my number? Maybe it wasn't right for that part. <laughs> just hilarious to say, like, these guys, but I'm, like, fans of be joking to me about stuff like that. Well, you mentioned that you had a few other projects on the horizon. Um, what is sort of, what's your process when looking for new um, projects to get into? Gosh, um, David had a film this year at Sundance called Spree that's going to be out soon, which is an incredible film with Joe Keery from Stranger Things. Um, and so, you know, that film was really a wonderful experience for him. And we started a documentary company last year called XTR. Um, and so we have a lot of really cool projects on the horizon with XTR and the documentary space. So I think we always just look for things that are fun and feel good and you know so the, older, the older we get the more we're like trying to be a little more selective because you end up putting a lot of energy into these different projects some of them you put so much energy and then they go nowhere you know so we're trying to figure out what's real what's not like where to put all of our energy you know um, and then just do things we love I mean that's that's great. I mean that's all the that's all the questions I have. Thank you, You're both awesome, for, Josh. Thank such you. a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to more people seeing the film. Oh, thank great. you. Stay safe and healthy and well. <laughs> you too. Stay safe and healthy. Have thank a good, have you. A good Bye.